Joining us here on the Rich Eisen Show to kick off hour number two, we saw him at the NFL owners meeting, not just because uh, I, I follow him on Twitter and everything else that he does for Sports Illustrated, but uh, when we had the soundbite of Matt LaFleur, we saw him lurking behind. He's a LaFleur, <laughs> he's a LaFleur lurker. Lurks. He's Albert Breer back here on the Rich Eisen Show. We saw you lurking, Albert. We saw you lurking. Did I look as awkward as uh, Darlington did oh. with his coffee cup oh, there? That oh, hold creepy. on a minute. That was creepy. I stand corrected. It was Robert Sala. You lurked behind Sala. You were a Sala lurker. Okay. Okay. Because okay. I think it was I think it was Darlington no, yeah. went behind uh, behind LaFleur was the uh, it, like he he said that he like thought he looked like a character from The Office, which I thought was pretty <laughs> pretty accurate. Albert, you've been at these uh, meetings for a long time. And, you know, the, the idea was coaches are sitting at a, a breakfast table and now they're just sitting at tables and now the tables aren't large enough. This thing is getting huger and huger because there's always news post free agency or post, you know, combine. And we haven't heard from these guys since the combine. And it's, it's just getting huger and bigger. It's unbelievable. This event. Yeah. It's like everything else. Right. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, I, I can remember going to the Senior Bowl, um, you know, it was 15 years ago, probably the first time I went, and I was like, this is great, there are no reporters here, <laughs> you know what I mean, like, and now, I think, you know, I'm, Jim Nagy could probably verify the number, but they're probably c- credentialing like two, 300 people for the oh, practices, man. you know, it's, it's crazy. It's just amazing the way this stuff has grown, and, um, you know, I was actually reading you know, our mutual friend Tom Curran, his story on, uh, on Belichick the other day, and I bet he put it well, he was like, these have sort of become like... Um, you know, almost de facto state of the union addresses for, for the coaches and the, and the owners, you know, that they, this is sort of, you know, now you're a couple, you know, months separated from the season and uh, for most of the teams anyway. And uh, you got a little ways to go, you know, obviously before OTAs get ramped up and it's just sort of every single team. And that's why the beat reporters all go. Every single team has this like little de facto state of the union address from its coach and, for some teams from the owner and the general manager as well. And so that's, I think one reason why we get so much information coming out of this is it just sort of feels like it's starting to set the table for the next year. Well then let's, let's jump into some of the stories that came out of this owner's meeting and narratives coming out of the owner's meeting. Um, starting with Belichick, let's start there. There was a topic bar that caused me to stop walking to my desk today on, uh, on ESPN on their get up program where it's like, has Belichick lost a step? You know, Brockman is sitting here, you know, uh, frequently. Y- you believe that Bill is coaching for his job coaching this for year. his job. I think Bob Kraft has made that clear. What do you think, Albert? Is that really the case in New England? I mean, I, I think this is a critical year for the organization. And um, I don't know whether or not, you know, Bob Kraft would have the stomach to, to press the, the button on that and to fi- actually fire Bill Belichick. But, um, you know, I think it's pretty clear, like, just hearing those two guys talk, they're – they're, they're not mocked up the way they used to be. You know what I mean? Like, and, you know, you sort of, it almost felt like to a degree there were salvos going back and forth, you know, like, I mean, that was a bomb that, that the Robert Kraft dropped on Lamar Jackson, you know, and, you know, he put that on the record and that, you know, left that at Bill's feet, you know, and then, you know, Bill basically saying like, check my resume when, you know, he's asked why fans should be, um, which should be optimistic about 2023, despite the fact they're coming off like by far the worst four year stretch of his almost two and a half decades in new England. You know, you can sign kind of see like a little bit of a disconnect there. And this is a critical year too, because they've missed the playoffs in two of the last three years. They've had under 500 records the last two of the last three years. Um, that's the first time I believe that might be the first time that's happened in Kraft's ownership, you know, since he, since he bought the team, um, you know, and then, on top of that, like, you know, you're talking about having a major decision with your quarterback coming after this year in, in that they'll at the very least have to make a decision on Mac Jones' fifth-year option after this year, presuming Mac Jones is the quarterback in 2023. And so, like, this is shaping up as, like, a pretty massive year for the franchise in general mm-hmm. and um, as to the direction of the franchise. And if it doesn't go the way that, that Bill Belichick's planning for it to go – you certainly can see what bigger questions are going to be asked. And again, I don't know whether or not, you know, like, you know, Robert would have the, 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 the stomach to fire the greatest coach in the history of the game. Um, but it certainly feels like things are not close to being in the same place they were five years As, ago. Especially since if we're, you know, on the Lamar subject with, with the Patriots, I mean, uh, Brady was there for a hometown discount, you know, season 
after hometown discount season. I mean, we, we looked it up. What the, the number of millions that that Brady made in his ten, tenure with the Patriots About was two twenty. Yeah, I mean, and it would maybe cost that much um, in guaranteed dollars to land Lamar Jackson. It doesn't strike me as Kraft would ever want to cut a check for a single player of that size, for regardless of the position. It just doesn't seem to make sense organizationally, regardless of what Meek Mill may have delivered a message to or for or for Albert. Here's the, here's the issue, though, like, Rich. If I, you know, like when I look at it, it, it sort of feels like the, the Patriots are built like a Tom Brady Patriot team would be built. You know what I mean? Like where – like they didn't need to be outstanding in every spot when Brady was the quarterback. Brady would come in and kind of save the day with some things. You know what I mean? Like so, that's why you didn't need to have Randy Moss on every team Brady played for, as long as you were balanced and you could send five guys into the route, trust those five guys, and have five competent linemen in front of the quarterback. Brady would sort of figure out the rest. And you know, in the years they were better in those spots, then Brady would elevate and the teams would be incredible. You know, and now it feels like. I, like they've got good skill position players. Do they have somebody who, when they break the huddle, the defensive coordinator is going to be sweating bullets over? Probably not, right? Um, and I would say one, if not both, of their tackle positions are still an issue going into the draft. So, like it kind of feels like a team is built to, 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 to for, for Tom Brady to come in in the shape of the day. They don't have Brady anymore. And so, what would be one way where you could create something on your offense that? you know, would change the dynamic. Oh, Lamar Jackson would be one way to do it. You know, if you're talking about breaking the huddle and having a guy that the defensive coordinators have nightmares over, that would be one way to do it is to make that guy the quarterback, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's something that's, that would be outside the box of what they've done from a financial standpoint. Then again, if you want to look at the other side of it, and I'll bring up the Moss example again, if you look at why Bill Belichick went and got Randy Moss, why he signed Tim Tebow, you know, that at, that, at one point, um, and why he's held Lawrence Taylor in, in the highest regard. You know, you, there are so many cases where there's a unique player who brings something different to the table that can make the Patriots more difficult to prepare for, and they can give Bill an edge over other coaches, and not just on sheer talent, but because it, he's bringing in somebody who just changes the dynamic completely. And in that way, Lamar Jackson would very much fit the bill. I don't think they're going to do it, but like I do think there's reason to believe that 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 Bill Belichick would be intrigued by the idea. The MMQB's Albert Breer here on the Rich Eisen Show. Let's talk Lamar writ large. Hitting send just as John Harbaugh sits down to talk to the media yeah. on a tweet yeah. saying, "I by the way asked for a trade on March 2nd," and then the uh, annual meeting wraps up as he tweets about how. He wasn't jaking his injury. If he was, then why was he trying so hard between weeks one and 12? Um, and he's, he's putting it out there. He's putting a lot of messages out there. Yep. Um, and part of the subtext for me, Albert, is that um, if he had uh, offer sheets on the table or in, an offer sheet on the table, he wouldn't be doing that. Does he have an offer sheet from anybody, do you think? No, and, and I think, like, my feeling right now is if an offer sheet was going to come before the draft, it would have come by now. Um, so, like, I, I mean, we could start with, like, that, that first piece, which is, um, you know, what I thought was, like, a pretty strate- strategic, savvy way of going about that. Um, I mean, we assume it was intentional. It couldn't have been an accident. It couldn't have been an accident that, that, that he has tweet. Um, his send on that tweet, you know, like whatever it was, three minutes into John Harbaugh's media session. I, I think part of that might be a salvo with the way the general public has seen this. Like, I think because he doesn't have an agent, like people are looking at it and saying, well, like, is this guy just wandering around aimlessly? No idea what he's doing. Um, this was kind of like, all right, well, you know, if you want to see if I can be cold and cunning and smart and savvy about this, watch what I'm about to do. And he did that. So, like, I think that that's part of it, you know. Um, and then just as far as where this thing goes, the reason I bring up the draft, Rich, is because I think that there could be teams in the top ten, a team or teams in the top ten, that might not be wild about this quarterback class, right? And might think to themselves, if Young and Stroud go one and two, I, we really don't feel comfortable taking one of the guys that's left, um, you know, at three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten. 
So why don't we wait until after the draft to see what we're going to do, and maybe we make a run at Lamar Jackson, and then spend our top 10 pick on a Will Anderson or a Tyree Wilson or a Jalen Carter or whoever else, right? And then when we get past the draft, instead of having to potentially sacrifice the fourth pick or the seventh pick or the 10th pick for Lamar Jackson, now we're talking about picks in 24 and 25. And we believe that our pick is going to be, say, in the mid-20s with Lamar Jackson as our quarterback. So I think for some of these teams getting past the draft and then not having to give up one of this year's picks could change the dynamic. As for where things stand with the Ravens, I think the problem right now is, um, you know, I think because Lamar's waited five years, he wants to win on every front. And, like, I respect him wanting to do that. Like, generally, it's tough to get an NFL team to agree to that. So, he, you want to win on term, you want to win on guarantees, you want to win on the money. Like, he, he wants to win on every front. And right now, the Ra- at this point, the Ravens haven't been willing to go the distance on that. I do think, like, that there's a compromise here in some sort of three-year fully guaranteed deal. Um, but I think it's going to take some compromise on Lamar's part to get there. And I will say that Lamar, I think right now, is standing on principle. I don't think this has anything to do with greed. So I think it's pretty unpredictable how he's going to handle the rest of this and whether or not – he'll really want to seek a middle ground with the, with the Ravens and where they're at. Uh, Albert Breer, a few minutes left with our Sports Illustrated friend here on the Rich Eisen Show. Walking around the owners meeting, the, the sense uh, you got about what the holdup is between the Jets and the Packers for the Aaron Rodgers trade, we all know, they all know, is going to happen. What, what is the holdup? You want me to give you some good news, Rich? Sure. I don't think this thing's in nearly as bad a place as everybody thinks. Okay. <laughs> like, I don't. I mean, is there are problems between Rodgers and the Packers? Yes. Um, that exists. But there are some incredibly tight relationships between the two teams, right? So, like, Joe Douglas and Brian Gutekunst, the two general managers, spent a lot of time together as road scouts. They've got a great rapport. Mm-hmm. The two head coaches, Matt LaFleur and Robert Sala, are, like, quite literally best friends, you know, and then you've got like the two owner, well, the owner and the de facto owner, I guess, and Woody Johnson and Mark Murphy. And both those guys were involved in the Brett Favre trade in 2008. Um, so they have experience working together in this sort of thing. So I think this thing's in a better place than people think. Might it be, might it happen on draft day? Yeah. I don't think it's out of the question. It happens this week, you know? So like, I think like there is definitely a deal to be done. I think progress has been made. And, you know, I think, this is about getting sign off from like every level of each organization. Um, but I think hmm. like this thing is, is in a good place now. And I think there's, you know, a good chance that Aaron Rodgers is a jet um, relatively soon, you know, certainly before the draft, I'd say probably before OTA start um, and maybe even at some point over the next few days. Well, to me, well, wow. Okay. Cause to me, it's got to happen before the draft. I mean, why would the why would the Packers not take draft choices now? I, I don't yeah, under, I wouldn't understand if, that. Especially, you know what, wait, Rich, especially if it is in a good place, right? Right. Like, I mean, especially if if Gutekunst and Douglas have made progress. I mean, like, the Jets want to have it done, too. You know what I mean? Everybody like the, does, and it's going to have to happen, you know, and everyone's like, who's got leverage? Who's got leverage? Everybody needs right. it to happen, and, and, and the guy involved who's being traded wants it to happen. And you don't want that guy around when he's unhappy. I mean, come on. It, it just makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. what's best for Jordan Love, right? No, it's best, best for everybody. Yeah. What's the best for Jordan Love? What's the best for Garrett Wilson? You know, if you want to start throwing names out there, like what's best for everybody is that, that this gets done, you know? And so, I mean, from you know, the, the, the guys at the highest level of each organization to the front offices, the scouts, knowing what they're doing, mm-hmm. you know, going into the draft, having yeah. a better, clearer picture of that. Um, you know, for the Jets, too, like knowing what picks they won't have. You know what I mean? Like, that's helpful. Um, you know, and then the coaches, of course, you know, for, for them, what's best is a deal getting done. So um, I think they're they're motivated. I, I, I think it was, you know, probably good for them to get to spend a few days together in Arizona at the owners' meetings this week. And, you know, I think – I, I think I said the last time to you, Rich, like, you know, when the, the, the temperature was turned up, like with the McAfee thing and yeah. um, with what, what Aaron said on McAfee and all of that, 
I think I said to you at that point, I think cooler heads will prevail. Yeah. I think we're at the point where, you know, it looks like cooler heads are prevailing and right. there's been good progress made. Uh, Albert Breer here on the Rich Eisen Show. I appreciate that knowledge. Uh, before I let you go, I, I need two tea leaf reads from you, okay? First one is read the tea uh, and the Leafs in, in, in the cup of the 49ers quarterback room. The, the comments made by John Lynch saying, well, Brock Purdy, I think, is in the lead position. And then, you know, the, the, the comments from Kyle Shanahan have been widely read as Sam Darnold's got a real shot to start. And what does this mean for Lance? Like, what, what, what is the current situation and thinking in that front office about their quarterback scenario? Here's what I, what I think is, so Trey Lance needs reps. Okay. Yep. Like Trey Lance needs to play. And like, if you look at like the number of throws he's had since, um, you know, 2020, I mean, I guess to, since like, really like since 2019, 2019 right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Right. 2019 was his last like full season play. The, that number is so small. Here's the problem the Niners are facing. Like last year was the year that they were going to sort of sacrifice his development, not sacrifice, but yeah. like, the feeling was at the beginning in the, in the summer, like Jimmy is still the better quarterback, but we believe with reps, Trey will be the better quarterback by the time we get to December and January, and we'll be rolling into the playoffs with him, right? Yep. And like now, I think this is the point where that team is such a win now operation. You know what I mean? Like you look at the way they're set up, and now they have this other young option and Brock Purdy. They can't afford to throw another season overboard in the name of you know young quarterbacks' development, especially when they've got another good option on the roster. And so, you know, I think what they want to see from Trey Lance is, like, it's up to you. You know, you can make this difficult on us. You know, like, it's up to you. And we're not handing you anything this time around. You know, and, and, and it sucks because that's not your fault. You got hurt. Like, I think they still love him as a person. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I think they still believe he could get there if he, if, if they gave him, like, a full year to develop with reps and everything else. But I just think they're past the point where, they're willing to make the sacrifice of saying, okay, like we're going to like, let all that happen. Let all this happen in the name of his development, because they do have another option now because they are such a, they do have such a win now roster. So, you know, I think the injury sort of opens the door for both um, Trey Lance to develop and and Sam Darnold to resuscitate his career. You know, both those guys are going to come in. I think the the Niners are hoping that they have a very, very healthy, a very, very healthy competition between the two for reps in the spring and summer while Brock Purdy is getting healthy. And really it's up to those two to make John Lynch or Kyle Shanahan change their mind. But as of right now, like I can tell you, like there's strong belief that Brock, Brock Purdy can be a really good starting quarterback in the NFL. And, uh, you know, like it'll, it, it really is on, on both Lance and Darnold to move, move the, the Niners press off that spot. Last tea leaf read from you, Albert. Um, the pro day for Anthony Richardson just completed uh, while we were yep. conversing. He looked dynamite. This just in, no surprise. Um, and yep. the Panthers visited everybody's pro day and took three of the four prospects out to dinner. I don't know if the Raiders muscled in for dinner reservations before they could secure one with Anthony Richardson. If it doesn't matter, they had a meeting with him anyway. But the bottom line is the Raiders are the ones who took Richardson out to dinner. What to make of that? Anything? Yeah. Not really. I mean, my understanding was some of the – because of the owners' meetings and all the stuff that comes along with it, mm -hmm. um, the couple of the Panthers guys couldn't get in in time last night to – to, um, to, 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 to to make like the big full on dinner um, with Anthony Richardson, I, I wouldn't make too much of it. Like I, I like I think that they'll I, my, I think that they're going to meet with him. I'm not a hundred percent on this, but I think that their plan was to try to do something with him again tonight, spend a little more time with him with a more full group, and they're going to have these guys, you know, to to Charlotte for um, for 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 thirty visits anyway. So they're going to get plenty of time with each of these guys. So. I think this was more logistical around. Sure, but what about the Raiders? But what about also? What about the Raiders' fact of it? Yeah, but huh? about, yeah, what about the Raiders' fact of it? The Raiders just took the dinner slot. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but, Raiders, so does that? But, but the Raiders, but the, but the Raiders <laughs> met, met privately with Will Levis and C.J. Stroud and Anthony and um, and Bryce Young the night before those guys' pro days last year. It's just the Panthers had the dinner slot last week, so this week the the Raiders had the dinner slot because the Panthers logistically couldn't get all their guys there. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't read too much into it. Like, I think, 
Like the Raiders are in a similar spot to the Seahawks. The Seahawks have done all this work too. Um, the Raiders and Seahawks, I think, are both in this spot where it's like we're comfortable with our guys, with Geno Smith and Jimmy Garoppolo, but we also don't plan to be drafting this high mm-hmm. again for a while. And so while we're sitting here, if we, we, may even, we may even be like right now planning not to take a quarterback at five or seven, but we at least need to have a full understanding of what we'd be passing on. And so, you know, I think it's smart for them to do all that work because if one of those guys, you know, winds up blowing them away or they get to the point where it's like, yeah, like we really think like we'd be in a good spot if we took Anthony Richardson, well, then what an awesome situation they would have. They'd have their a starting quarterback for the next year or two, and they'd have the, the, the flexibility to be able to sit Richardson for a year or two years, which a lot of people think he needs. And, you know, have him ready to go as their starting quarterback in 2024, 2025. Right, exactly. And, and but, but the question is, is, I guess, well, and then I'll let you go. One month from tonight is the draft. What's more likely? I'm going to use one of our staple segments here from our program. What's more likely, the Cardinals make the pick at three or one of the two teams you just mentioned trades up to go take Richardson if he's sitting there at three? I think neither of those things happen. Ah. Um I think the Cardinal. I, I think the Cardinals are going to trade the pick. I just. I don't know if the Seahawks or Raiders will come up. I think the the Cardinals are in a good spot to trade the pick. I I think so much of this is on Levis and Richardson, though. I, I like increasingly, I'm starting to feel like it's going to be Young and Stroud, in in, in one order or the other, one and two. Mm-hmm. Um, and that puts the Cardinals in a tremendous position on paper because you would think like that. Okay, like some team is going to try to hop the Colts, right? Because you see the Colts there at four. Yep. You know, I, well, most people expect them to take a quarterback there. But what if no one's that in love with Levis or Richardson? You know, like that. So that, that, that I think is where things are. And so, and, and I don't know that Seattle or Vegas, like, I think, like, you know, like they, they could take a quarterback if one falls to them. I don't know that they would get aggressive and move up. I think that sort of still remains to be seen. Albert, you're the man. Let's chat again real soon. Greatly appreciate it. Love to seeing you lurking at the owners' meeting. I appreciate you lur- lurking here. Appreciate it. And I'll try to live. Up, I'll try. I'll try to reach that Darlington standard next time around. Right? Yeah, you're good. You're good. You're already aces in our book, as you know. Uh, thanks for the call, Albert. You're the man. You be well. All right. Thanks, Rich. That's Albert Breer. Follow him. A must follow on Twitter. Must right here on the Rich Eisen Show. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, twelve to three Eastern, for free. 